Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be in a building with air conditioning. It could be comfortable. Over the last few months, maybe even a little bit longer than that, I've been talking about the doctrines in God, of God's church. I, I started off, I think I started off with faith, but I went back and got uh, spoke on repentance and baptism. And today I want to go forward into the fourth doctrine of the church, that of laying on of hands. Uh, remember Ron Dort said in one of uh, the CDs that I, I listened to that when he first became a minister, uh, the man who, who, he, uh, who was his leader and was moving out, he was taking his place. He told him that he wanted him to give sermons on all the doctrines of the church. So he said, well, I guess I can put the laying on of hands with the sermon I'll give him baptism because it's not all that involved. It'll be short and uh, I can combine those two. But his minister told him, no, you, when you look into the Bible, you'll find out that the laying on of hands can have its own sermon. There's a lot to say about the laying on of hands. And today I want to go through a number of scriptures and talk about the laying on of hands, what it means, what its purpose is, and use the example that the Bible has to, to show how God has used that from the very beginning. Not at the time of Adam and Eve, or, or even Noah, but when he dealt with Moses, you know, when, when he first called him Moses, he did it one-on-one. -on -one. He was talking verbally with, with Moses. But later on, he began uh, and asked Moses to lay hands on different individuals. And we'll cover that in, in our study today. So I want to review all, a number of, of, of scriptures to see how Jesus, our high priest, used the laying on of hands to do the work that the Father sent him to do. And today we're using that same system because that's what Jesus Christ wanted us to do. Let's begin by turning to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, and we'll begin reading in verse 7. And I'm, I'm reading from the New International Version. Uh, the wording is a little bit uh, more fluid and I can understand a little bit better. It says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, talking about the Father. And he was, he was heard because of his reverent submission, because of his attitude and you know, the way he looked at the Father. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all of us who obey him and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Verse 11, uh, a warning is given to all of us. He said, in verse 11, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths. And I guess you could say that uh, laying on of hands is one of the elementary truths. It's one of the foundational truths in the Bible and it's foundational to the church of God. He said, you need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for, mature, uh, for, the, for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Notice he says, we have to be constant in learning God's truth. And verse 1 of chapter 6, he says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to, to death, 
or that lead to sin, and of faith in God, instructions about baptism, uh, and the faith of God, instructions about baptism, and the laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Now this is another part of the warning. He says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, for once you would know God's truth, it's impossible for those who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and who have tasted the God, uh, the goodness of the word of God and the power of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. Once we have God's truth, we know it, we have God's spirit. If you give that up and think it's not important, if you fall away from that, these scriptures are saying it's impossible to come back to God. He said, because to their loss, they are crucified, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. So we need to be careful that we appreciate God's word and that we are steadfast and that we do all that we can to gain knowledge and understanding. Let's turn to uh, Acts chapter 18. Acts 18. We, we'll see an example of, of Paul as he traveled. Acts chapter 18, and we'll begin reading in verse 23. Paul, as he, as he was accustomed to, was traveling from, from uh, different places out in the, between Antioch and uh, Corinth. Now, we always talk about Corinth, but we don't realize how big of a city it was. You know, at different times in, in history, the population fluctuated quite a bit. At one time, there were 200,000 men and over 500,000 slaves. And the population grew and grew at different times and were almost the size of New Orleans at one time, especially after the, hur uh, the hurricane and all the people moving out of New Orleans. Corinth had a population almost equal to New Orleans. That's a huge city. And sometimes we don't realize that. Uh, again, verse 23 says, After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. And meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, called, uh, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man and with thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor, and he taught about Jesus accurately. So he knew God's word, and he was teaching God's truth. Though he only knew the baptism of John, baptism unto repentance, yet he was able to, to teach those in that area at that time. Say, he began to speak boldly in the synagogues, and when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to uh, Acacia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving, he was a great help to those who by the grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now, while, uh, verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 1, said, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we haven't. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, Apollos was teaching about baptism. And he said, uh, 
then what baptism did you receive? And it said, John's baptism. But Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of Jesus. Now, we would use the term, they were rebaptized. Actually, the, the, the first baptism was void, it wasn't valid, it was incomplete, because they didn't baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. One, one that Paul baptized them, in verse 6, he said, When Paul placed his hand on them, the Holy Spirit came to them, and they spoke in languages and prophesied. There were 12 men in all. So we see that some individuals were baptized, but they didn't have the ceremony of the laying on of hands, so they didn't receive God's Spirit. And actually, Apollos was not, uh, it wasn't ordained to, to be able to baptize them. He didn't have that authority. So he was not allowed to, to lay hands on them and uh, allow them to have God's Holy Spirit. Let's turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. We see another example about hands being laid on individuals. Acts 13 verse 1 says, In the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mannion, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. He said, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which that I have called them. So after that, they had fasted and prayed, and they placed hands on Saul and Barnabas, and then they sent them off. They had a re God had a responsibility that he wanted them to take care of. But we see that these men were sent as apostles. They were not of the original 12, but God said he wanted to set them apart. So he had the individuals lay hands on them, the disciples to lay hands on them, so that they could go about his business. If you want to read uh, more about that, where, he, where they were sent, you can look in Acts 14, verses 21 and 28. I don't, we don't have time to go through that, but if you would like to see that, then you could read those scriptures. When an individual is ordained to an office of greater service in God's work, hands are laid on him. That way they receive God's Holy Spirit. God's ministers pray over them, asking Almighty God to the head of this church, to continue to work with them and setting them apart to be used as he chooses. God sets these individuals apart and allows them to have a spirit. This is the purpose for laying on of hands, imparting God's Holy Spirit, his power, his authority is done through the laying on of hands. In every case where the laying on of hands has been administered, it has set apart an individual for a special service. That's the method that God chose at, uh, as a form in his government to receive his Holy Spirit, to be set apart. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 48. Genesis 48. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Genesis 48, verse 1, he says, Sometime later Joseph was told that his father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. And when Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel relied, uh, rattled his strength and sat up on the bed. Jacob said to Joseph, 
God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me, and he said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and will increase your numbers. I will make you a community of people, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt, before I came you, uh, to you, here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. And the children born to you after them will be yours in the territory they inherit, and they will reckon under the names of their brothers. As I was returning to Padan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrat. So I buried her there beside the road to Ephrat, and that is Bethlehem. Now when Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, who are these? That's sad, you know, when you have a, a grandfather not being able to see his son most of his life, and now he has two great, two, two grandsons that he really never spent any time with, doesn't really know them. But he knew that he, he, in his heart, that he wanted to uh, lay a blessing on, on uh, Joseph and his two sons. And he went through a whole lifetime and never had much time to spend with either one of them. Or, 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 you know, not get the chance to spend much time with Joseph and not with his grandsons at all. That is sad. But he is going to bless Joseph's two sons says, they are the sons God had given me. And uh, Israel said, bring them to me so I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him and his father kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again. And now God has allowed me to see your children too. And the purpose why he did see them was because uh, they had come to receive a birthright. So Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on the right hand and Israel's left hand, Manasseh, had, uh, and Manasseh on his left toward Israel's right hand and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger. And crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the, the firstborn. And then he blessed them. And he blessed them and he said, May the, may the God before whom my, my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. When Joseph saw that his father was placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took his, the whole of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to him, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know he too will become a people, and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will become a group of nations, like we say, a commonwealth of nations. So he blessed them that day and said, in your name will Israel pronounce this blessing, and God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you, as one who is over your brothers, I give the ridge of, of land that I took from the Amorites with my sword. So God blesses his, uh, Israel's two grandsons and gave them the blessing that he had promised Abraham years and years before. 
and he did this by laying his hands on their heads as a sign that God was passing a blessing on for all eternity. You know, we, we live in this country as a, a special blessing that God gave to Abraham and to Jacob. And it's, it's a meaningful blessing. If we had to live in another country, uh, at, especially at a time like we're going through today, life would not be pleasant. We'd have a rough time making it. So that blessing and that ceremony, that simple uh, ceremony of laying on of hands has changed the entire world. It affected our lives in every way. The doctrine of the laying on of hands is important. Let's turn to Numbers, see another example. Numbers uh, chapter 8. We'll begin reading in verse 5. Numbers 8, verse 5. The heading above these verses is the setting apart of the Levites. The Lord said to Moses, Take the Levites from among the other Israelites and make them ceremonially clean. To purify them, do this. Sprinkle the water of the cleansing on them and have them shave their whole bodies and wash their clothes and so purify them. Have them take a young bull with his grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil. Then you are to take a second young bull for a sin offering. Bring the Levites to the front of the tent of meeting and assemble the whole Israelite community. You are to bring the Levites before the Lord and the Israelites or to lay their hand on them. So again, we see another uh, ceremony being conducted to transfer blessings and transfer responsibility to the tribe of Levi. The Aaron is to be present, uh, Aaron is to uh, present the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering for, uh, from the Israelites so that they may be ready to do the work of the Lord. They're being set apart to do a work, a priesthood. This is a major event that's taking place in the, the life of the Israelites. After the Levites lay their heads on the heads of the bulls, use the one for a sin offering, and the Lord had set for the other burnt, uh, burnt offering to make atonement for the Levites. Have the Levites stand in front of Aaron and his sons, and then present them as a wave offering to the Lord. In this way, you are to set the Levites apart from the Israelites, and the Levites will be mine. They will be the the order of the priesthood. God rules his kingdom uh, through these different doctrines that, that he tells us that we need to be a part of. In fact, these four doctrines in Hebrews 6, the first four, if you haven't experienced all four of them, you will not receive salvation. All four of these doctrines are required for salvation. If you want to be in God's kingdom, you have to participate in all four. That's the way God ruled his kingdom up until now, and that's the way it'll be the world tomorrow. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 27. Numbers 27. Another example of an individual being set apart for a great service. We'll begin reading in verse 12. Numbers 27 and verse 12. This is where Joshua is, Joshua is to succeed Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, go up, the, up this mountain in the Abraham uh, range and see the land I, that I've given to the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will gather, be gathered to your people, as your brother Aaron was. He's telling Moses, you go up to this mountain and take a look. He said, after this, you will die, just like your brother Aaron died. He said, uh, 
and your brother Aaron was, for when the communi uh, community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both you, both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before their eyes. These were the waters at Mirabah, Kadesh, in the desert of Zin. Moses makes no comment. Moses said to the Lord, may the, may the God of the spirit of, of mankind appoint a man over this community to go out and come in before, uh, before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. And when I said Moses didn't make a comment, he didn't make a comment about him dying at that time. But God did give him instructions, and, and Moses was telling God that the Israelites needed a leader. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit. So Joshua had God's Holy Spirit before uh, Moses was, was told to, to choose him. He says, So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hands on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. Uh, he is to stand before Eleazar the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of Israelites will go out. At his command, they will come in. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eliezer the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hand on him and commissioned him as the Lord had instructed through Moses. So this is a ceremony that was done publicly. Other individuals participated in it. And it was very meaningful. Let's turn uh, to chapter 8 of Acts. Acts chapter 8. We'll see an example in the New Testament. Acts chapter 8. And we'll begin reading in verse 9. It says, Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave their attention to him. This man is a divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. He was a magician, so they looked up to him. But he was an individual who knew, who knew God's word, and he, he spoke. So when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon believed, Simon himself believed that he uh, and was baptized. He followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles. When I said that, that Simon knew God's truth, I made a mistake there. It's not Simon. I, I was thinking about Apollos. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. Um, Philip was the one that was doing the teaching. And, uh, He had not been uh, ordained to, uh, you know, to baptize them and allow them to be have hands laid on where they would receive the Holy Spirit. When they arrived, they prayed for them and they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, that they had simply been baptized into the name of Jesus. So Peter and John placed their hands on them and then they received the Holy Spirit. A story about Simon in verse 18. 
Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the hands of the apostles, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, when, a, when an individual is ordained and set apart for a special purpose, like a minister, there are, there are special gifts that, are, that they receive, you know, during the laying on of hands. And uh, uh, Peter and John, uh, Peter had uh, the gift of discernment. He said, and he answered in verse 20, he said, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your, in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Though Peter could see right through him. He knew that he wasn't submit, being submissive to God's government and that he wasn't willing to make changes in his life and he was not going to receive God's spirit. And so Simon said, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And when they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. See how see here how important you know uh, the, the laying on of hands means and we realize that it, it's an important ceremony in the Church of God today. In Acts 14, verse 14, Acts 14, 14, in fact, let's back up to Acts 13. It says, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, called Niger. I read that already, but I, uh, I wanted to bring out a, a point that Barnabas and Saul were set out to do a work that, were called, that, uh, that God had called them for. Turn to First Timothy. First Timothy. Chapter five. First Timothy chapter five. And we'll begin reading in verse twenty two. This is a warning, uh, uh, instruction that Paul was giving Timothy. He told him, he said, do not be, ha do not be hasty in laying on of hands. Uh, <clears throat> do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So he's, he's warning Timothy to not lay hands on an individual uh, who is not ready. You know, need to uh, have fasting and prayer. Consider that individual and, and ask God about it, pray to God about it, and counsel with others about it if you have that opportunity. First Timothy four, chapter four. And verse fourteen. Paul is telling Timothy, do not neglect your gift which was given to you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. 
So we see a, a scriptural uh, proof that when you receive uh, anointed or ordained, God gives gifts when you're anointed, special gifts. Now we all have talents, but God also gives spiritual gifts. And sometimes it gives more than just one spiritual gift. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Second Timothy chapter 1, we'll read verses 6 through 9. Again, this is Paul talking to Timothy, encouraging in him. He said, For this reason I remind you to, to fan the flame of the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. The King James says he given us a, a gift, a sound mind. That do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of, of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and his grace. God tells us, to, to uh, fan the flame of God's spirit in us. And we, all of us have received a gift at baptism. All of us have been anointed and had to lay it on of hands at baptism. A gift was given to each one of us. Every one of us has a special gift. And sometimes we don't, we don't know what, all the gifts that we have, but God says to fan into flame the special gift that was given to you. One example that we can read about that is in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. This is the example of, of uh, Joshua. And verse 9, Joshua, the son of Nun, will be filled with the spirit of, of wisdom, or was filled with the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had his hand laid on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. So we see again that um, Joshua had wisdom and knowledge, and that was a spiritual gift. Wisdom is one of the spiritual gifts. Another way that we experience the laying on of hands is found in James chapter 5, verse 14. This is one we're all familiar with. James chapter 5 and verse 14. This is the prayer of faith. We'll begin reading in verse 13. He says, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. King James says the prayer of a faithful man uh, is important that it does much. Let's turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark 16. Verse 18, again we see a, an example. Reading the last part of the verse, he said, they will place their hands on the sick people and they, they will get well, they will be healed. I might also want to mention here that in the national, international version says, uh, 
right above verse 9, it said, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. They think that was added. It's not in the original uh, scriptures. And the footnote that says, serious doubt exists as to whether these verses belong to the Gospel of Mark. They are absent from the important early manuscripts and display certain peculiarities of vocabulary, style, and theological content that are unlike the rest of Mark. His gospel probably ended at verse 8, or its original ending may have been lost. That just a sidelight, but as a possibility that, that from verse 9 through, um, I guess at 20, should not be in the scriptures. Many thousands of people have seen the proof of God's healing. I know many of us have seen individuals be anointed, have hands laid on them, and those individuals were healed. God has shown that through history. You know, give, give us examples of individuals who were healed by the laying on of hands. The world doesn't believe, you know, in, in seeking God when they're ill. They go to the doctor right away and never think about asking God or oh, God's minister to anoint them for the sickness. And the reason for that is their carnal mind is the enmity against God. In Romans 8, verse 7, it says that their the mind is carnal, that it's against God. They're not subject to the law, neither indeed, indeed can be. It also says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, we won't turn there, but they don't understand that God's laws are important and that we are blessed by following God's instruction, by following his will. So when you go to God for healing, you are submitting your body to Jesus Christ. By the laying on of hands, you are symbolically setting apart yourself in God's sight putting yourself under his authority and submitting your sick or injured condition to God's divine will as a living sacrifice. God tells us to be separate, to come out of this world. And when we show faith, and the faith and trust that we have in God by asking for the laying on of hands when we heal, it shows that we believe in God and we're willing to submit to God's government. That's the way it'll be in the kingdom. We have to have an attitude of doing what God says and of obeying God. The laying on of hands is just one of the major doctrines of God's church. It's important and it, it has a lot to do with the Christian life, along with repentance, faith, baptism, uh, the, lay, the laying on of hands, uh, and also, uh, the next two would be re uh, the resurrection and the eternal judgment. God's doctrine are, are very important in the life of a Christian. <clears throat>